All right. Good afternoon. I hope you're having a fantastic fall. My name is Randy Sider with CSE Services. I'm a principal here at the firm, and I am joined by our guest today, Sean King. Sean is an attorney, CPA, uh, and is the mastermind of our victory against the IRS at the U.S. Supreme Court in a 9-0 to zero sweep. So we're glad to have you here with us. I uh, do want to ask that you keep your computer or phone on mute unless you're asking a question. And we will pause to uh, have you ask questions as we go. Uh, Sean, you want to tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay, Randy? Yeah, you sound great. All right, good. Uh, yep, I'm Sean. I'm an attorney and CPA, one of the founders of uh, CIC Services. I started my career in the qualified retirement plan space and going back, gosh, 15, 20 years ago now, started working with uh, captive insurance companies and um, today spend most of my time working, helping businesses set up and operate their captive insurance companies. I've lived in Puerto Rico for the last six years and um uh, highly enjoy it and uh, encourage anybody else who may be looking for a little piece of heaven to retire to to uh, seriously consider Puerto Rico someday. Very nice. And Sean uh, is humble. He is a uh, super genius, always a step ahead of the government and the competition and knows what industry is going to be hot next. And so uh, as he's moved from retirement plans to <clears throat> captives, he's always stayed a step ahead. And as I mentioned, uh, masterminded um, beating the IRS 9-0 at the Supreme Court. So uh, it's really an honor to have him on today. Uh, and I'm your host today. I'm Randy Sadler. I'm a principal here at CIC Services. Again, we are a captive insurance company manager. And quickly, I just explained that my background, I learned risk management in the Army. I was a tank commander for five years and had responsibility for soldiers and equipment and fuel ammunition moving large distances. So obviously safety was paramount. And after a few corporate roles, uh, I've been here 11 years at CIC Services, helping businesses own their own insurance company, protect their business, keep more of their hard-earned profit. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today, which is helping your clients, uh, or if you own a business, your business, keep more of your hard-earned money while protecting yourself. Uh, these are our standard disclosures, and I will gladly send these slides to you after our discussion today. And you can read these, and if you have any Questions, we'll be happy to discuss them with you. And then I'll tell you a little bit about CSE Services. We are what's known as a captive manager, which essentially means we help small, mid-sized businesses set up and own their own insurance company uh, that's able to provide coverage to them. We currently manage 150 insurance companies. Uh, we're headquartered in Knoxville, Tennessee. We have right at 20 employees. Uh, and then across uh, all of our principals, we have well over uh, three centuries of experience in the insurance industry. So very, very uh, formidable team here at CIC Services. And as I mentioned, uh, we did in fact push back on the IRS over a notice that they created 2016-66. Uh, Sean, you want to speak a little bit to uh, the, what 2016-66 was and uh, why we attacked it and, and why we won? Sure. So the IRS has a long history of hating on captives. This goes all the way back to the 1970s. That's the bad news. The good news is that by and large, uh, with the exception of a few recent uh, sort of egregious cases, they've lost pretty much every court case of consequence um, since that time. They lost the Humana case, the UPS case, the rent center case, the RBI case, and a few others. Um, and so they've kind of turned their attention now, since they've not been able to win in court, to try to win through a flood campaign. They're essentially trying to do their best to blur the lines between what's a legitimate captive insurance company and what's not, and to dissuade uh, members of the public from uh, forming honest, even honest, legitimate captives. One of the ways they tried to do that was through Notice 201666, which designated virtually all 831B captive insurance arrangements as a type of reportable transaction known as a transaction of interest. In issuing that notice, the IRS did not follow the law. They did not follow proper procedure. Uh, they had no rational basis for issuing the notice. And so we sued under the Administrative Procedures Act. The IRS tried to defend themselves uh, by hiding behind a very old law called the Anti-Injunction Act. They basically said to the judge, Judge, look, um, 
we don't really dispute that what these guys are saying is true. Perhaps we did, in fact, violate the law when we issued this notice. Uh, but you can't do anything about it because this other act, the Anti-Injunction Act, forbids you from enjoining us. Uh, we disagreed with their interpretation of the Anti-Injunction Act, uh, sued and took that all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where we eventually got a nine to nothing judgment in our favor. The case was remanded back to the district court, uh, where the district court with the IRS now deprived of that defense, found that the IRS indeed did violate the law and had behaved arbitrarily and capriciously in issuing the notice and had no logical basis for concluding that 831Bs were being abused, uh, or at least none that was in the administrative record, and so um, vacated the rule. So 2016-66 no longer exists. Uh, it has been vacated by the courts. The IRS is now in the process of kind of trying to take a second bite at the apple. They just a few months ago issued a proposed regulation that would uh, once again make most 831B captive insurance arrangements a type of reportable transaction. Uh, we don't think this law is any more valid than the last one. If, if it goes through as originally proposed, it will almost certainly be likewise overturned. Uh, but the good news is that even if it does come into force, it's significantly less burdensome and restrictive than notice 201666 was uh, in its scope, which is uh, still a victory. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and really, for that reason, uh, we won Captive Manager of the Year in 2021. That was the year that we uh, beat the IRS at the Supreme Court in 2020 and 21. Uh, and then uh, we won again in 23 for a lot of our innovative design in helping businesses uh, ensure and protect against risk. So uh, we're you know definitely a, a winning Captive Manager on, on many fronts, uh, if you will. So, Sean, today we're going to tackle three questions, and uh, I think this is really important. First, you know, what is a captive insurance company? I think that's the first question. The second, you know, why do we do the 60-day countdown? And the third, really, and most important, why is it important? Why is what we're talking about important? So, uh, Sean, tell us about what a captive insurance company is. Yeah, so a captive insurance company is just a closely held insurance company, uh, a small privately owned insurance company that is formed typically primarily to insure the risks of some related entity. So the captive can be a subsidiary of the entity it's trying to, the main entity that it's trying to insure or well insure, or it could be a brother sister structure where the owners of uh, the main uh, operating entity also own the captive insurance company uh, or a similar enough set of, of owners. And the purpose is to basically formally self-insure risks um, that are relevant to the operating business. Captives can be used to replace commercial insurance. We have a lot of clients who paid large commercial insurance premiums for dozens of years. And because they're diligent with their uh, risk management programs, et cetera, they have very favorable loss histories, meaning that all those premiums they paid for all those years are just a sunk cost down the, down the tube. Uh, they can form their own captive. They can ensure a portion of those risks through their captive. And if they continue to do well managing their risk, they can now capture through their captive insurance company some of the profits that the unrelated commercial carrier um, was historically capturing. They can also be used to ensure enterprise risks. These are types of risks um, that most all businesses have that typically are not insured at all in the commercial market because it's just too expensive or unavailable um, or significantly underinsured in that market. We can talk about what some of those risks are later. They're often used for warranties. Anytime you're in a business that's selling something, cars, uh, farm equipment, et cetera, uh, and you're providing your buyers with a warranty, you can provide that warranty or ensure that warranty risk through your captive and obtain some significant uh, advantages by doing so, tax and asset protection advantages. It can be used for performance bonds to ensure employee benefits like certain uh, health care uh, and really any combination of the above and a lot more that we just don't have time to even mention today. This is a sample brother-sister captive structure. So we have the business on the left. This is usually the existing operating business. 
And then we have the captive insurance company on the right. Uh, for most of our clients, um, this is a new entity that they would be forming because most of our clients have not had a captive before. And the business on the left simply uh, buys insurance from and pays premiums to the captive insurance company on the right. Uh, and in exchange for that, receives coverage uh, for certain losses. Potentially, also, if it qualifies as a valid insurance company, some pretty significant income tax benefits as well. So this is an example uh, captive insurance structure, sort of the flow of funds. Again, the business is paying the premiums over to the captive insurance company. The captive insurance company issues policies. And the captive is going to build up reserves over time. If it does well, if the operating business continues to have a favorable loss history, that captive is going to build up quite a balance sheet. Uh, and so it's ultimately important that the captive invest those assets in a way that benefits the captive insurance company, supports its future claims paying ability. And for those of you on the phone who are um, in the investment business or the wealth management business, um, working with captive insurance companies to manage their assets is a uh, sort of a, a, a bit of a specialized skill. There are some unique factors there, but it's certainly within the capabilities of most wealth advisors with just a little bit of training and experience. And it can be a very, very um, significant and profitable market. So why do people form captives? Well, uh, despite the fact that the IRS is hostile to them, the U.S. government is actually very much in favor of captives. Um, this is demonstrated in a couple different ways. One is the existence of the huge potential tax benefits that are available to captive insurance companies. The government would not offer that if it wasn't wanting to incentivize these structures. But also we have this page here, uh, which was uh, basically scraped from ready.gov, the Department of Homeland Security's disaster preparedness website. On that website, they have a landing page for a small business. And this is a chart that was taken from that landing page. And on that page, they're basically imploring small businesses, which are the backbone of our nation's economy, to really consider all the various risks to which they're exposed. You'll see some of the hazards noted there, fire, explosion, natural hazards, um, cyber attack, utility outage, pandemic disease. We used to say pandemic disease and people would laugh. Um, not so much anymore. It's a very real risk that uh, many yeah. small businesses would have been, were devastated by and would have been even more so were it not for the government bailout programs, the PPP program and some of the others. And so uh, these are very real risks that the government is inviting small businesses to consider and um, really strongly suggesting that businesses take steps to protect against those risks, including buying potential insurance where it's available uh, and even potentially captive insurance. So when we first start working with a business owner, um, we kind of will just begin to make a list in our own minds of all, and working with the owner of, of all the different things that could go wrong in the business that would cost it money. Um, and you'll see some of those things listed here. We'll talk about a couple of them, but we break those down into two categories, operational risk, which are the risks um, in, of something going wrong inside the business with its operations that exposes it to liability or losses. And then strategic risks. Strategic risks are things that could go wrong outside of the business itself in the economy as a whole or the environment as a whole uh, that might disrupt the business or cause it to suffer losses. So under the operational risk category, I'll just mention a couple of different ones real quick. One is administrative actions risk. This is the risk of some governmental agency, state, local, or federal, or a quasi-governmental agency coming in and auditing your business, investigating your business, suspending your license, uh, doing something that causes you to have to pay out a lot of money or causes you to lose revenue. Classic example is uh, restaurants that have liquor licenses. You know, you've got a lot of 18-year-old waiters. Uh, one of those 18-year-old waiters forgets to card a customer one too many times and the license gets suspended for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. That can be devastating to a business. Um, that's an administrative action short of risk that can be insured. 
both in the commercial market at quite cost, quite a heavy cost, or through captive insurance companies uh, also. Uh, under the strategic risk er section, um, I'll just mention things like business interruption. This is the big one. This is something going wrong in the world. It could be war. It could be um, a pandemic. It could be a uh, powder outage that lasts for weeks or months because of a terrorist attack. Something going wrong that disrupts your business um, and causes it to lose money. Could be some forms of supply chain interruption um, uh, as well. Uh, those are insurable risk. It could be regulatory changes. Perhaps the government passes a law that uh, makes what was previously a perfectly legitimate business activity into something illegal. And, uh, and now it costs you a lot of money because you can no longer engage in that activity. Well, that even that is potentially and insurable risk. So those are just examples of the enterprise risks that many insure through a captive insurance company. Yeah, very good point. Sean, somebody talk, We're somebody all talk. getting our nationwide uh, emergency alert right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of, of risk, the, right? Test of the emergency broadcast system, exactly, speaking of risk. So uh, yeah. give everybody uh, 30 seconds or 10 seconds to uh, <laughs> go to their cell phones and quiet that alert. Yeah, uh, Sean, while while you were speaking uh, in our chat, um, somebody wrote in uh, UAW strike. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Screen Actors Guild strike. Yeah, UAW strike. Those sort of things. Yeah. So, uh, taxation of insurance companies in general. So. Generally, insurance companies are taxed in one of two ways. Your larger insurance companies, those that we're all familiar with, and the larger varieties of captives, are typically taxed under Code Section 831A. Uh, even then, there's some major potential significant income tax benefits just by virtue of being a legitimate insurance company. Legitimate insurance companies are the only type of business that I'm aware of, and I'm a CPA and attorney with a background in tax, that get to deduct expenses that they're not going to have to pay for one year, three year, five years, 10 years. Insurance companies get to actuarially predict what their future liabilities are going to be under the policies they issue. Discount those liabilities to the present, set aside a reserve to cover those liabilities and take a deduction today for that reserve, even though they're not necessarily it's expensive for several years. That's quite an advantage, and it can shield 60 to 70 percent or more of some insurance companies' revenue from taxation. It's just a deferral, but it's a deferral that rolls over every year and effectively can end up being uh, an indefinite deferral in some cases. Then you have uh, the smaller variety of captive insurance companies. Those are insurance companies that take in less than 2.65 million per year of premium and meet a few other criteria. And they can't elect tax treatment under code section 831B. 831B says that if you're a qualifying insurance company, you're not gonna pay any US federal income tax on your underwriting profits each year. So premiums received, less claims paid, that's your underwriting profit, and that gets taxed at zero. So imagine a situation where you have an operating business that's highly profitable and has lots of risk. You create a captive insurance company. If your operating business is big enough and has enough risk, you may pay up to $2 million a year, just to pick a number out of the air, over to your captive insurance company to insure those risks. That's tax deductible just as if you had insured those risks through State Farm or Lloyd's of London or somebody else. And again, assuming your insurance company is a legitimate insurance company, it's going to take in that $2 million effectively in zero percent tax bracket. So just by moving $2 million bucks out of your left pocket into your right pocket under a formal insurance arrangement, um, you can save, you know, 800,000, a million dollars, 40 to 50 percent of the premiums each year in combined uh, state, federal, and local taxes. So the tax benefits are so huge that um, 
this is partly why the IRS is giving me so much attention. Uh, and to be fair, there are some folks out there who um, have aggressively used captives to gin up tax deductions. They have insured unviable risks. They have paid inflated premiums over to their captives just to inflate the tax deduction. Uh, and those are certainly things that you don't want to do and you don't want to be around. John, your sound's gotten a little worse. Are you able to get a little closer to the mic? Got my earpiece in. Is that any better? A little bit. Let me try one thing. It was good when you started, but it's kind of declined. Give me one second here. All right. Is this any better? That's better. Yeah. yeah. I think it was some background noise. I was able to turn it off. So this just sort of shows you uh, a hypothetical here with two different businesses. Um, we have the two different columns on the right, business and business with ERC or enterprise risk capital. Assume that each of these businesses are identical in every way with one exception. The business on the right formed a captive insurance company and insured through that captive uh, 10 years ago, all of the types of insurance that you see noted in the green box. The business on the left did not, it just continued to take its profits each year, pay taxes on those profits, kept some retained earnings in case something goes wrong in the future. Well, you can see that over a 10 year period, um, all else being equal, the business on the right with the captive, assuming this favorable, favorable claims history, ends up having both more insurance coverage and more reserves, more liquidity in the event that something goes wrong or if things don't go wrong, just more profits than the business on the left. The business on the left only has the basic insurance coverage and you know almost $5 million, four or $5 million less in reserves. Uh, the difference between those two is largely a product of the tax benefits that are available to captive insurance companies. Uh, the business on the left had to pay tax on all of its profit each year before it could set aside some retained earnings as a contingency reserve. The business on the right paid some of those profits over to the captive on a tax deductible basis. The captive took that in tax free, hence, the business on the right has a significant number of reserves available to cover this as well. So, what happens to a captive when uh, the claims history is favorable uh, over time? And the answer is uh, the owner keeps the profit. Unlike with commercial insurance, where you're paying money out to a third party and it's gone forever, if your captive insurance company has a favorable loss history, um, the owners are going to keep those profits for themselves. Mm -hmm. So a business with a captive, in short, uh, is just generally almost always better off than one without. It has a stronger business model, better risk management, improved cost control over its insurance expenses, the opportunity to generate profits from the insurance business. If the captive is set up right, the assets of the captive can be asset protected from both the business's creditors and the business owner's creditors. Uh, the result is over time, you can potentially accumulate a lot of wealth. And if it's a legitimate insurance company for federal income tax purposes, uh, some pretty major uh, tax advantages as well. Awesome. Yeah. So, Sean, that's an outstanding description of a captive, what a captive does, uh, the benefits. Obviously, you mentioned more insurance and more money. Uh, there's very few places in life where you get more of two things, right? Usually you have to trade off one to get the other. Uh, but in the case of owning your own insurance company, you actually get the best of both worlds, more insurance protection and more money. So now we come to our second question, uh, which is, you know, why the 60 day countdown? Why, and we do this countdown every year. Uh, and so why do we do that? Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, it's, it's partly uh, marketing, but it's marketing for a very important reason. And that is that uh, these captive insurance companies are critically important to the lifetime sustainability of a business. Uh, if 
more businesses had captives before COVID, many of the businesses that were bankrupted by COVID would still be around today and all the jobs they had would still be, uh, still be here. Um, so it takes time to properly form a captive. And if you uh, understand the importance of it, you're gonna wanna get one formed in time to really ensure all of next year. And it takes about 60 days to do that. Uh, we can really accelerate that quite a bit and, and maybe get it done in as little as uh, you know three weeks or a month. Um, but to do that, everybody's going to have to be moving super fast. You're probably not going to be able to do the level of diligence that you're, uh, that you're going to want to do. Let's take the time doing it like you prefer to do. And, uh, and consequently, you're not going to be able to get it done. So we announced the 60-day countdown in order to get word out that uh, if you're wanting to get a captive insurance place in company in place before the end of the year to ensure your business for calendar year 2024, uh, now's the time to do it. That's not to say that you can't establish one in the middle of 2024 at some point. You certainly can. Um, but the sooner you get one of these established, uh, the sooner you get this insurance in place, the more uh, robust and protected this is. Very good. Yeah. So we just had a question in the chat. Will um, will these be available? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and why the 60 day countdown? Uh, well, quickly, I'll cover this portion. You know, think about a, you're a client or your business. Uh, the business is a goose, right? And that goose hopefully is laying golden eggs or, or profit, if you will. And so what does every business do typically in October, November, especially small middle market companies, is they assess how to allocate those golden eggs, right? Where do we where do we invest those, right? So maybe some goes into capital expenditures uh, and maybe some goes into dividends and owner profits or taking care of employees. But what is a obvious logical choice for where to allocate some golden eggs? I mean, if you had a goose and it was really laying golden eggs, what would you do? Uh, well, obviously, you'd protect the goose, right? Uh, you'd build a fortress around that goose every year. You'd take some of that money and protect the goose. And that's exactly what uh, captive insurance is doing, is protecting the goose that's laying the golden egg. Uh, and so, Sean, let's go to the, the, the third question that we were going to answer. You know, Sean, why is it important? Yeah, so... Yeah, a simple way of illustrating the importance of this is, you know, uh, if you had to bet as a business owner, if someone put a gun to your head and said, uh, you know, you're going to bet the future of your business on whether or not over the next one to 10 years, things are going to be better off to, than they are today or worse off than they are today. And I don't just mean for your business, but in the, in the world as a whole, what would you say? Um, I think most people at this point, most business owners that I'm familiar with are really anxious about the future. We have extraordinary high levels of debt. We have higher geopolitical uncertainty than we've ever had. We have supply chains that are Asia dependent. We already know from COVID how easy it is to disrupt that. That could also be disrupted by things other than pandemic disease like war or uh, sanctions or any number of other things. And so uh, the fact of the matter is, it's a dangerous world out there. And uh, I think most would agree that um, things are probably, if we had to bet, going to become more challenging over the next five or 10 years rather than less, which means we need to be better protected. Than better. Environmental change is obviously a, a significant factor. Uh, we all remember the California wildfires. I'm from East Tennessee. Some of you may remember the it was all over the news that the fires in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, five or six years ago, really burned down about a 20 to 30 percent of Gatlinburg. We had the deep freeze in Texas. We had the COVID-19 pandemic. There's just a lot of things that are going on in the world and that are likely to continue to go in the world that are beyond your business's control that can adversely affect um, your business and your client's business. And, um, and that's just an ideal uh, potential way of dealing with some of those is with capital insurance. Yeah, I remember the uh, remember the tanker getting stuck in the Suez Canal. <laughs> so supply chain uh, definitely comes to mind. Uh, we do see 
more and more clients uh, ensuring credit risk in a captive. Uh, cyber is a big one. Uh, and largely many of our clients that have commercial cyber insurance are amazed if they read the policy closely at uh, how many times it won't pay. All right. So it's if you're going to have cyber coverage, a captive can write a policy uh, that is much more broad and covers a lot more things. And, and that's an important point, Randy. Um, you know, there's actually a whole, there's actually a huge consulting firm that many insurance companies hired you know, 15, 20 years ago. One of the big main brand consulting firms. Right? I don't think they're here today. <laughs> you would all recognize the name. Um, and they actually prepared a proposal that they took around and sold and pitched to insurance companies who paid them millions of dollars for their ideas. And the whole pitch was basically deny, delay, defend. Whenever right. it comes in, your first step is to uh, d deny it. Your, your second step is if, if they push back, then you just delay and drag out paying the claim as long as you possibly can. Um, and, and finally, uh, you defend it. You know, if, if you have to, you, you have the deeper pocket as the insurance company. You go to, if you're more willing to go to court, then you can extort um, your clients into taking a far smaller settlement that they're actually contractually entitled to. And this is actually the business model, the stated business model of a great number of commercial insurance carriers out there today. If any of you or your clients have filed major insurance claims, you, you probably have had something, experienced something like that. So um, captives are a way of getting around that and having claims paid far more reliably and having far less exclusions in the policies. So what are some uh, commonly insured risks? Uh, legal defense is one, uh, just paying your legal bills if you're sued or certain things that uh, perhaps your other regular commercial carriers coverage wouldn't cover you for. Uh, supply chain disruption, uh, receivables. Uh, many clients uh, are distributors and maybe 80% or more of their revenue comes from one or two key contracts with the supplier or with a key customer. What happens if the supplier defaults? What happens if the customer who owes you 80% of your revenue defaults, um, goes bankrupt, what have you? Significant risk there for a great new business. Uh, cyber attack, we talked earlier about administrative actions that can result in fines or suspensions or business closures and um, a great many other things uh, as well. Yeah, reputation damage is, a, is one of my favorites. And we've had quite a few clients that have had to file a claim to pay for dealing with an attack on their reputation. That includes the, the lawsuit to do a cease and desist and then the cleanup work of a PR campaign or a, a a campaign to bury bad bad comments on the internet way down. <laughs> so. Yeah, you guys may remember the Volkswagen big uh, emissions scandal a few years ago. Um, Volkswagen dealerships across the country was it? It's also was it also Audi? There were two or three different brands that were affected. Um, dealerships across the country really paid a price for that. Their reputation was damaged. People were skeptical of Volkswagens and. For a while um, because the manufacturer not the dealer the manufacturer had been cooking the books and misrepresenting their their miles per gallon that's a reputational damage that um, could be and in some cases was actually insured through captive insurance companies so the loss of revenue resulting from um, that reputational hit could at least be partially compensated by a captive yeah, Sean, we got a, a, a type in here too. Um, cargo insurance for overseas shipments. The answer is yes. We do have clients that insure import, export, even one client that insures shipping perishables overseas. And every now and then those uh, perishables get stuck in a port that won't let them in uh, and the entire load's wasted. So yeah, we, we do insure cargo. That's a great question, by the way, because that's very difficult to insure. Uh, what do deductibles typically look like? Well, deductibles are really determined through the underwriting process. So they can be zero, but in many cases, they may be, you know, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. So it really depends on the size of the risk uh, and the frequency 
because uh, typically what we don't want to do is just have the captive paying lots of low of high frequency claims that are low amount, but we want it to step in when the business really has a surprise, right? So um, that's, uh, you know, so it can be anywhere from zero to some, some few thousand dollars, to, but it, again, it depends on underwriting. Can you place a single parent captive in 60 days? Yes. Generally, yes. It depends a little bit on facts and circumstances, but probably 80, 90% of the time, if the client's ready to roll, they're ready to make decisions quickly, divide the data quickly. It can be done in 60 days. It can be done as little as three weeks, but you really don't want to <laughs> wait that long if you can avoid it. Yeah, very good question. Now, you know, the, the, when you ask about being done in 60 days, and Sean, and Sean said yes, uh, there may be cases where we need a reinsurance carrier. Uh, in those cases, um, we may not be able to do it in 60 days, but not because we can't form the captive and draft the policies and price it, but because we're not able to get the reinsurance in time. However, uh, many of our clients participate in a risk pool uh, where we have 120 insurance companies that share risk. Sean, you want to tell them a little bit about the pool and, and how that can provide uh, a huge backstop and also um, help you get started faster? Yeah, so generally, um, most every client participates in a risk distribution pool, and it's a way for your client's captive insurance company to reinsure out to other captives, other clients of ours typically, uh, a portion of the risk, usually 51% of the risk. So if your client forms a captive and insures 10 different types of policies for a premiums that total, let's say, a uh, million dollars, just to pick a round number to make the math easy. Um, it pays a million dollars over to its captive to insure those risks. Its captive pays 51% of that over to a reinsurance company. Uh, in exchange for that reinsurance company, which is kind of a uh, stand-in for all the other 100 plus captives in the pool, uh, assuming part of the risk. And then if your client has a claim, let's say it's got a $100,000 claim, um, your client's captive pays 49% of that claim. All the other 100 captives in the pool, I'm using 100 as a number, uh, pay the remaining 51,000 of that claim in proportion to the premiums they receive. That's called a quota share pooling arrangement. It's very common, uh, not just in the captive insurance industry, but in the insurance industry in general and it can work very well. Now, uh, if the pool claims are significantly lower, and they always have been, than the 51% that's paid over to the reinsurer, then over the course of the year, the reinsurer uh, pays back to your captive insurance company that excess, uh, less a fee that it charges for the, its role in the structure. So it's not like your client's giving up 51% of the premiums to the reinsurer. Uh, if the claims history is good, and it generally is, they're going to get um, not all, but virtually all, in most cases, of that money back over the course of uh, 12 months or so. Very good. Yeah, so pooling is a very effective way to spread risk and uh, get help when you need it, so to speak. So we do have another question. What do companies do with their expiring insurance policies? As it is unlikely that all the expiring policies end at the same time when the captive coverage starts. So basically what we do is we start the captive coverage when they expire. So the captive may actually be staggered. Uh, it may have, you know, the captive doesn't have to have all policies begin at the same time. Uh, it can stagger. Uh, and then very often what we'll do is is try to get the captive policies lined up. So we may have a nine month policy and a 12 month policy and a six month policy. Uh, and then we'll try to over time, you know, one of the policies might be an 18 month uh, and we'll line over time, we'll line them all up as best we can. Usually we can do that within a year or two. Uh, would runoff insurance be required? It depends on what we're covering. Um, if they're old policies, were occurrence policies, possibly not, but uh, if they're claims made, uh, yes, in many cases, but uh, the captive can write gap coverage if needed. So um, definitely, definitely a good question. Hopefully I answered what you're looking for. If I didn't, um, you know, maybe clarify it a little better. Please send me a list of information needed for a feasibility study. 
do you need a list of lines of coverage to put into a single current captive? Yeah, so um, it looks like uh, J.C. Bennett. Uh, yeah, if you would, um, send me an email after this, and, and we can talk about uh, what's needed for a feasibility study. Uh, we've got a pretty simple questionnaire that we start with uh, to go down that road. Very good. Okay, let's keep going. Hopefully we've answered everything in the chat. Uh, obviously, Sean, uh, one of the biggest underinsured risk was COVID. And as, as you and I have discussed before, during COVID, a lot of commercial carriers did not cover COVID losses because business interruption was only triggered in the event of property damage, therefore no business interruption. Um, most of our captive clients that had uh, broad form property coverage, business interruption coverage, um, administrative actions coverage, they had their COVID claims paid uh, to the tune of uh, about $20 million of COVID losses paid by captives that we managed. So uh, our captives really came through during COVID. Yeah, uh, thanks, JC. I see you got to jump. Uh, if you would send me an email, that would be great. Um, another question, what happens when commercially available coverages are cheaper than what you've obtained through a captive? So Sean, you want to tackle that? Yeah, they're, they're normally not going to be cheaper than what you have obtained through a captive on an apples to apples basis. Like if you're lining up, say, uh, to Randy's point, if you're lining up a business interruption policy on the commercial market with a business interruption policy from the captive, yeah, the captive premium is going to be much higher. And if all you're looking at is the title of the policy, it's going to look like, oh, well, you're overpaying. Why would you buy that from your captive when you can get it cheaper in the commercial market? But as Randy just said, and there's actually a website out there, a litigation website that tracks all of this, right. like commercial insurance policies universally had an exclusion in them that said they would pay for business interruption. But one of the triggers for coverage was that there had to be physical damage done to your property. Well, many insureds tried to claim that uh, the presence of a contagious virus on the property was a form of physical damage. Uh, essentially, no courts bought this. And this was litigated in state after state after state, and court after court after court sided with the insurance companies and said, no, just having a contagious virus on your property is not uh, damage and therefore does not trigger coverage under the policy. But that provision is not typically in business interruption policies issued by captives. All you have to have is a, uh, a, a an event um, that's covered under the policy and pandemic disease is that triggers uh, an interruption in your business that causes a loss of income. And that's it. Uh, once you basically meet those threshold criteria, you have a claim, you can file the claim, the claim gets adjudicated and assuming it's valid and legit and got paid. And to Randy's point, um, you know, we paid out over, I think, almost $20 million in COVID-related claims um, for our capital insurance companies in 2020. Yeah, very good point, Sean. And uh, yeah, I, I would also just echo cyber as a classic example. Many commercial cyber policies uh, will deny your claim if the cyber attack came from overseas. Uh, or many of them will deny your claim if the cyber attack was caused by human error. Well, that wipes out a lot of coverage, right? So most of our cyber policies cover those two things, all right? Uh, does the policy cost more? Yes. Is it worth it? Yes, it is, especially if you have one of those occurrences. So uh, very good, very good points. Okay, let's keep going here. A lot of great questions. Keep them coming. Uh, I think, and I'll cover this section very quickly. Uh, you know, captive insurance works, and I'd be glad to share this article with you. This is from um, this is from Captive International, published a few years ago, and uh, it was written by uh, Sean King and then Jaina Patel, who was working with us then. And the interesting thing is that captives insured were often paid quickly. Their claims were approved fast. They got the money when they needed it versus being drug out. Uh, and some of the cases that were covered in this article, a trucking company, uh, that had their city routes canceled. Now, their long-term routes were long haul were still going, but this covered the loss of revenue from those city routes. So they didn't have to lay off these drivers. I mean, they didn't want to lose their employees, right? Uh, ophthalmology practice that was closed is non-essential. The captive gave them the money to not have to lay off employees and be able to pay their utilities and continue until they were able to reopen. The same with a pediatric dentistry practice. Exact same thing happened. 
Uh, and then we had a group of employee performance consultants uh, and all their events were canceled. So uh, they filed a claim and that, give, that gave them the money to really make a strong transition uh, into doing the same consulting uh, via via um, a virtual platform, but they were able to spend money to get a platform that was good. Uh, a lot of their competitors laid people off. Uh, and then when COVID was over, they came out much stronger. Had they not had the captive to pay a claim, uh, they would have been in the same place their competitors were trying to start over and trying to rehire employees that had been burned and now had a bad taste in their mouth. Uh, so it was huge for them to be able to take care of that. Okay. None of CSE services clients who had a COVID-19 loss went out of business during the pandemic. That's huge. If you think about 120 insurance companies, 120 clients, uh, what are the odds that not one of them went bankrupt during COVID? I mean, that, that defies all the odds in the rest of the U.S. And uh, I'll send you the slides if you ask for them, and you can go here and read this article in Captive International. All right, Sean, our bonus question. Uh, <laughs> Who is, and we've got uh, 12 minutes left. So who is a good candidate to own a captive? That's a great question. Um, I want to say most every business that has sufficient revenue um, and, and risk, which is if you've got a business that's more than 10 million in revenue, maybe even more than 5 million in revenue, 90 plus percent of those are going to qualify. But as a practical matter, if you're an advisor and you're trying to uh, approach businesses or inform businesses about captive insurance companies, um, there are some that just aren't going to be worth it. So basically, you're looking for closely held businesses with the fewer number of decision makers, the better. Again, this is not like a rule. We can do captives for publicly traded companies. In fact, most publicly traded companies do captives, but um, that's probably not the market that many of you have access to and the sales process in that market is going to be a completely different animal. So we're, we're talking here about small and mid-sized businesses, typically closely held, the smaller, uh, fewer number of owners, the better. Uh, you want owners typically who are highly entrepreneurial. Um, normally that means it's a first generation business owner. By the time you get the second, third generation business owners, the entrepreneurial spirit is usually somewhat less diminished. Um, so often first generation business owners who are uh, highly entrepreneurial, meaning that they are risk takers, they know how to engage in cost benefit analysis and put their big boy pants on and, and make important business decisions. And, um, and thirdly, you want a business owner who um, has some tolerance for complexity. Right. If you have a business owner who just their frustration tolerance is so low, they can't be bothered to even set up a 401k for their employees because it's just too big of a hassle for them. Probably not a candidate just because temperamentally they're they're not going to want to understand the captive insurance company. Setting up and operating the captive is actually probably less difficult, less complex, less burdensome than setting up and operating a 401k. Um, but that's just kind of a good sort of, uh, sort of uh, they, they need to have some tolerance for, for complexity. And then other than that, they just need free cash flow. Uh, that's less of an issue, though, than it might look at first, because businesses that don't have free cash flow might be able to finance, premium finance, a significant portion of the premiums. So by the time you count uh, maybe some premium finance money, plus if it's a legitimate insurance company, the tax benefits the business is going to earn, those two things together can often uh, help come up with the free cash flow the business needs to uh, ensure those important risks. All right. So if you're an advisor uh, to a successful business, if you're a business owner, then obviously we would love to talk with you about owning your own insurance company. Uh, and see if it makes sense for you. But if you're an advisor, what would be in it for you as an advisor? Well, first of all, um, deepen client loyalty uh, as your clients are better protected, able to protect their business. Uh, then uh, in many cases, they will feel uh, much more loyalty to you as their advisor. Uh, the second would be if you're an asset manager, uh, as Sean alluded to, captives do have assets under management. Uh, and we call them sticky assets under management because insurance companies build up reserves for future losses. Uh, 
Uh, and very often, uh, this is money that the business owner won't run off and spend to buy a boat. Uh, so a uh, great place to manage assets. And we do work with quite a few asset managers. And we'd be honored to work with you if you are in the asset management space. Uh, and then we do fee share with advisors that partner with us. And we would be uh, honored to partner with you as well. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our, our slides today. If you'd like a copy of the slides, send Sean or me an email. Uh, and we've I've recently written a book with Noah. Who, uh, Noah Miller and I on our team have written a book called Fortune Favors the Insured, The Definitive Guide to Captive Insurance for Middle Market Companies. If you'd like a copy of the book, uh, shoot me an email. I'll send you the ebook format. We do have it in hard copy as well, which if you want hard copy, I'll be glad to send it to you a hard copy. Uh, we're sending them out as uh, electronic flip books if you'd like one. Uh, any questions for Sean and me? I see one already. I'd like to get a copy. Electronic is fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you can uh, just shoot me an email, Joe, that would be good. Um, be hard. It's hard to keep up with everybody on the thread here. Uh, any other? Any other questions? All right. Very good. Well, it's been an honor to be with you guys today. Talk about captive insurance. And uh, please do reach out to Sean. Reach out to me for the slides, for the book. Uh, if you if you uh, own a business and uh, want to protect it, reach out to us. If oh, you got one more question here, Sean. Let's see. Oh, appreciate you guys. Thank you so much, uh, Christensen. Yeah, really appreciate it. All right. And uh, yeah, if you reach out to one of us, we'll be honored to speak with you, help you, work with you, and everybody have a fantastic uh, rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.